thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor
Even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see you, you're working Even when I don't feel that you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see you Jesus, we, we thank you that you, you make a way where there is no way. Lord, I thank you that you guide us, that you hold our hand, that you are with us every step that we allow you to be. And Lord, I ask that you would help us to open up our hearts to really let you lead us, that we would really truly let you be in control, that you would show us the areas where we're not giving you full control and help us to let go today. Help us to really truly surrender to you. Help us to really, truly see the areas that maybe we don't want to look at in our lives and in our hearts. The areas that you need to be number one, the areas where you need to be first, and help us to put you there and help us to leave you there and allow you to be a part of our lives, leading us, holding our hands every step of the way. Thank you for that, Jesus. Have your way in this service and in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And welcome to Grace at Home. Uh, this is Communion Sunday, so if you haven't got your communion stuff, your grape juice, your crackers, or whatever you use, <coughs> uh, run, run grab that stuff, and uh, we'll do communion together separately at the end. And before we do all that, let's pray for our friends that haven't yet come to know Jesus, and let's pray for ourselves as we open up God's Word that He would speak to us by His Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for our friends that haven't yet come to know you. I thank you that you love them more than we do. And I pray that you would use any means necessary to bring them into your kingdom so that we can all spend eternity together. And Lord, if you'd like to use us, we're available. Just show us what to do and we'll do it to the best of our ability by your grace and lord we thank you for your word we ask that as we open it up that you would help us to open up our heart to what you have to say to us this is a time just to punch a time card and say that we were at church but lord we want to hear from you so that we can be changed that's why we're here this morning so speak to us Change our hearts, make us more like you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 6. We're going to start with the 27th verse and read to the 36th verse. 
It says, but to you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer him the other cheek also. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are, are taken away t from you, excuse me, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would like them to do to you. And, you know, I want you to notice, he, he prefaces this thing by saying, but to you who are willing to listen, I say. Then he says, love your enemies. What? Love my enemies? Do good to those who hate you. Oh, I'll do something to those who hate me, right? i tell you right now. Bless those who curse you. Yeah, I'll bless them out. You know, that, that's, that's the human tendency to think the people who come against us are evil. No, the devil's evil. The people are just being used as pawns. And God loves them too. You know, have you, have you ever stopped to realize that your worst enemy, God loves that person as much as he loves you? And he wants us to, to learn to do the same thing. He goes on, verse 32. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? For sinners love those who love them. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners lend to other sinners for a full return uh, with interest. <laughs> Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. Then your reward from heaven will be very great. And you will truly be acting like children of the Most High. For he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked you must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. We'll stop there. <coughs> so, what is love? There's been song after song after song written trying to describe what love is. The world's definition of love is an emotional attachment or affection for someone. Love to the world is feelings based on someone might, on, on what someone might do for you or to you. Therefore, when the object of a person's love in this way begins not to respond in the manner in which they are expected to, they stop doing the stuff that, that made the person love them. The person's feelings change and they say they are no longer in love. Well, a love like this is destined to die. <coughs> um, <coughs> God's love is not based on emotions at all. God's love is a decision to care for another regardless of the other person's response. That's love. That's what God has done to us. This kind of love will last forever. That's the kind of love God wants us to have for other people. So, <coughs> Jesus tells us to turn the other cheek. And from my count, we have four. <laughs> If I truly love somebody, this is what he's really saying, if I truly love someone, that person is more important than whatever they may take from me. See, Jesus is telling me that violence is not the way to defeat evil and that love will triumph over evil. If you ever read The Cross and the Switchblade or Run Baby Run, David Wilkerson went up to a tough 
gang member named Nikki, Cru Nikki Cruz. And Nikki would hold a knife at David Wilkerson's throat because David Wilkerson was preaching love, preaching the grace of God. And he would just say to Nikki Cruz, God loves you, Nikki. Jesus loves you, Nikki. And Nikki would say, stop saying that! And threatening to slit his throat. Which wasn't a, a, an empty threat. Nikki had slit many people's throats. That's how David Wilkerson turned the other cheek. And that statement, God loves you, Nikki, Jesus loves you, Nikki, is what brought Nikki Cruz, a violent man, to bow his knee to Jesus. It wasn't David Wilkerson fighting back. It wasn't David Wilkerson getting security guards. It wasn't any of that. It was simply the love of God turned this man's heart around and subsequently his whole gang in New York City was turned around for the kingdom of God. So Jesus says that in, in our text this morning, 27 through 31, but you who are willing to listen, I say, love your enemies. What if David Wilkerson wasn't willing to love Nikki Cruz and decided instead to start a war with him. What do you think would have happened? Well, I guarantee you, Nikki wouldn't have come to know Jesus. Neither would the rest of the gang. He continues, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who hurt you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, offer the other cheek also, and the other, and the other. If someone demands your coat, offer your shirt also. Give to anyone who asks, and when things are taken away from you, don't try to get them back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. That's the bottom line. Treat other people in the same way that you would want people to treat you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. We call that the golden rule. But it doesn't go for just people who are nice. Kind of easy to do that for people that are nice, right? Yeah. Not so easy when somebody's cursing you, doing mean things to you, stealing from you, all that kind of stuff. And yet God tells us, love that person too. Treat that person who's so nasty to you, treat that person in the same way you'd want to be treated. Yeah, but they're not treating me the way I want to be treated. That doesn't matter. So I've, I've done a lot of counseling with, with married couples, and um, it's so funny because one will behave badly toward the other, and when you ask, well, why did you, why did you do that? Well, he did this or she did that. It doesn't matter what the other person does. I'm responsible for what I do. Period. I'm responsible for me. Evelyn's responsible for her. Chase is responsible for him. Whitney's responsible for her. You got it? We're to do the right thing, whether the other person is doing the right thing or not. Period. That's what Jesus is telling us here. A clear message. Those people who are your enemies, do to them, treat them the way you want to be treated. Romans 12, verses 18 through 21. says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. 
Dear friends, never take revenge. Never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scripture says, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, and this is going to sound like Jesus, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Read that. Oh, I like the burning coals part. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. That's what God wants us to learn how to do. Somebody does something evil to you, do something good to them. Tell them how much Jesus loves them. I don't want Jesus to love that guy. I don't want that guy going to heaven. He'll probably live right next door and I'll have to see him for all of eternity. And I don't call that heaven. Everybody you meet, God loves that person. And God would like to turn that person around when they turn their life over to Jesus. So you didn't just become a you know, great guy or great gal on your own, did you? Wasn't it because you turned your life over to Jesus and he made a difference in your life? Mm -hmm. And we're all kind of working for that, aren't we? None of us are perfect. We will be when we see him face to face, but none of us are perfect now. We're, we're striving to do that, but we're human still. Am I making sense? Yes. And that person who's doing you know, evil towards you, well, if, if you let them be the focus of your attention negatively, you're hurting yourself. You're helping them accomplish what they're trying to do. They're trying to hurt you. Well, you're hurting you by getting so stressed out over that mean, evil person, right? When instead, you could go and do something nice. You could bring them a gift. You could go out of your way to do nice things for them. And God says in that way, they're going to feel shame about the way they've treated you. Hopefully, turn around and turn to Jesus. I hope that makes sense. Romans 2, 4, 6, 8. Who do we appreciate? <laughs> Romans 2, 4. Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant, and patient God is with you? Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? His kindness is meant to turn us towards repentance. God's kindness. Not his anger. Not the fire and brimstone. Now we, we know he could do the fire and brimstone anytime he wants to. Not the lightning. No. How kind he is to you. Has God, has God done stuff for you that you didn't deserve but he just did it for you because he wanted to. How many of you had that happen? <coughs> Evelyn and I have had that in abundance. Romans 5.8 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. In another place, it says, that while we were God's enemies, Christ died for us. See, he did what he's telling us to do right now. <coughs> Excuse me. So, love your enemies. How? Good question. I asked that question a lot when I first read this. What we have to do to truly love your enemies is we have to learn to see them through God's eyes. We either see them like God sees them. Oh yeah, he wants to throw them into hell. No. <coughs> he actually doesn't. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> God.
God actually wants everybody to go to heaven. What we have to do is remember where we came from. Remember who we were when Jesus found us. Learn to see them through God's eyes. God had compassion on me. How about you? He showed mercy and kindness to me. How about you? Luke 6, 32 through 36, our text this morning. If you love only those who love you, why should you get credit for that? Even sinners love those who love them. I mean, yeah, that's easy, right? It's, you know, somebody doing nice things to you, somebody loves you, certainly you're going to love them back. And if you do good only to those who do good to you, why should you get credit? Even sinners do that much. And if you lend money only to those who can repay you, why should you get credit? Even sinners lend to other sinners for a full return. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. That's a tough one then your reward from heaven will be very great and you will truly be acting like children of the Most High. For he's kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. In other words, people. You must be compassionate just as your father is compassionate. Did God show compassion to you? If he did, we need to show that same kind of compassion to other people because we're God's kids and as his kids and we, we need to show an example of God's love and that comes by seeing you know people who do mean things people who are angry people who are what we call evil are they evil um, those people have been hurt by someone else who's probably doing this, who probably did the same things to them that they're doing to you. And so they're lashing out because they're angry and they're hurt. And if we could stop and ask ourselves, well, why? is that person behaving that way? Well, because they're hurt. They've been injured. They've been wounded by another person who's probably acting the way they're acting. Am I making sense? Yeah. And so then we can have compassion on them even though they've been hurting us. And we can start actually praying for them, not praying against them. A lot of times people read these passages, I'll pray for them, God, get them. It's not the kind of prayer he wants us to pray. He wants us to legitimately pray, God, would you please help this person heal up from the wounds of their life? And if I can help in that aspect of things, I'm available. I think that's how God wants us to start praying for them so that we can then see them through his eyes. He sees the hurt. He's not sitting around wondering what the hurt is. He knows what it is. Romans 5, 8 through 10. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight, by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. See, it says right there plainly, we were restored to friendship with God while we were still enemies. 
Well, I wasn't God's enemy. Yes, you were. Before you were following him, you were his enemy. Because you're either on God's team or you're on the devil's team. Does that make sense? Yes. And if you're on the devil's team, you've joined God's enemies. That's not a good place to be. Is it? No. I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to live there very long. Because I, I understand that when you're on that team, things get really hot eventually. But see, God looked at us and He restored a relationship with us that we never really had. Because since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, our relationship with God was cut off. They were cast out of the garden, remember? And in that same circumstance came to every single person who was born on the planet. We were born into sin. That separates us from God. That kicks us out of the garden. God restored something that had not been there for us. It was there initially for Adam and Eve. Well, we're not Adam and Eve. No, but he restored that relationship with himself. With us. While we were still his enemies. Through Jesus Christ. Am I making sense? Yes. Since God did that for us, shouldn't we do that for other people? Or should we demand that they be perfect when we're not perfect? How many of you have done something wrong or thought something wrong or neglected to do something right this week? Today? <laughs> I mean, you didn't want to do that, but you ended up, you know, stumbling for some reason. We stumble for some reason, but since, since that's true of us, we don't need to hold everybody else that we know to a different standard. I'm not perfect. Why do I expect my friends to be perfect? And especially, why do I expect my enemies to be perfect? <laughs> They're enemies. If you watch TV, enemies aren't perfect. Enemies are evil. Not the Diet Coke of evil. First John 4, 10 and 11 says, This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. What does surely have to do with it? Shirley, if you're watching, tell me what you have to do with it. But this is real love. See, what the world calls love is, is mostly lust. What the world calls love is taking when God's love is giving. Love that's taking is not real love at all. When you really love somebody, you look to make that person's life better. You look to do good things for that person. You don't do good things for that person so that they'll do something for you. That's not love, that's bargaining. <laughs> and I'm sorry, some marriages are built on bargaining, not love. And they're not destined to last. But this is real love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice to take away our sins. So many people are waiting for that other person to do something good for them before they will love that other person. Well, God didn't take that stand. He didn't wait for us to stop being His enemies. Real love is that you take the first step. You take the first step towards that evil, mean person that's, uh, that you call an enemy. Not an enema, 
but an enemy. I think we can all agree we don't like enemas. But God took the first step. You should take the first step of showing love towards that enemy. He took the first step by sending Jesus. And he says, dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. I'll add something, that much, that way. Because that's what love is. The question is, do we really want to be like Jesus? Well, if you're reading that stuff, I'm not sure. <laughs> See, God is love. Everything about God steers right to love. Everything about him flows from love. All the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and all that, it all flows out of love. If God is love, we should be loving. Right? Mm -hmm. We'll read this again. Luke 6, 35 and 36. Love your enemies. Do good to them. Don't wait for them to do something good to you. Do good to them first. Lend to them without expecting to be repaid. That would be a gift. Then your reward from heaven will be very great, and you will truly be acting as children of the Most High. You'll truly be like Jesus, because that's what he did for us. He got on the cross before we ever did anything. Is that right or not? Yes. We hadn't done anything. And yet when he was on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He said it over and over and over again. He was thinking of us. The writer of Hebrews says, For the joy set before him, enduring the cross, scorning its shame, he sat down at the right hand of God. For the joy that was set before him. You and me and all the other people who have believed on his name for salvation. That was his joy. All of us. Now, I don't take the narcissistic view that a lot of people try to take, especially songwriters these days. They try to make their Christianity as narcissistic as the world makes everything else. It, my Christianity isn't, what, what can God do for me? Has God done a lot of good things for me? Yeah, he sure has. But what can God do for us? I mean, yeah, I'm glad he saved me. But you know, when he was on the cross, he wasn't just thinking about me. Was he thinking about me? Yeah, he was. But it wasn't just me. It was me and you and everybody else out there who has surrendered to Jesus. Am I making sense? And it goes on to say, for he is kind to those who are unthankful and wicked. You must be compassionate, just as your father is compassionate. You know, the entire law is summed up in Two commands, and they're basically summed up in this sentence. Love God and love people. That's what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to love God and love certain people. No, he wants us to love God and love everybody. And when we see somebody acting wickedly, we should feel sorry for them. 
because they're caught up in the devil's plan for their life. God doesn't have us do wicked things. Right? God doesn't ask us to do evil things. God has never asked you or me to steal from somebody. God has never asked you or me to murder someone. Has he? No. When we see somebody that's acting like that, we should feel sorry for them. Genuine compassion for them. We should genuinely say, I, I, I really hope that somehow Jesus will get to that guy and turn his life around. I know it's silly, but I find myself watching movies and TV shows and praying for the people in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> you ever done that? Anybody? <coughs> Evelyn raised her hand. I'm not the only one. But, it, you know, it's sort of a habit. You see somebody going through something, a hard time, you start praying for them. Oh, Lord, please help Superman get away from the kryptonite. That kryptonite's going to kill him, God, if you don't get him away from that. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. I'm reading out of Matthew 22, 37 through 40. It's also Galatians 14 through uh, 5, 14 through 15. It says, this is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God. Love people. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. They're based on two sentences. One sentence, actually, two phrases. Love God and love people. It's simple if we boil it down to that. Now, why is the other stuff there? Well, a lot of it was there because the Jewish people used to try to find, you know, little outs in the law. The law said, do not lower a, a bucket into a well with a rope on the Sabbath day. So what would they do? They would tie their belts together and lower a bucket into the well on the Sabbath day. You think they missed the meaning, the, the, the real spirit behind the not lowering the bucket? Had nothing to do with the rope. Had everything to do with the bucket. And God knew they were like that, so he had, to, he had to spell everything out ad nauseum. Have you noticed most of everything in the, in the first five books of the Bible when talking about the law? The law, is, the law is repeated over and over and over again. So they'll get it into their head. But it's, it's simple. Love God and love people. Treat other people in the same way you would want them to treat you. John 13, 34 and 35 says, But now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. If we love like Jesus is asking us to love, the people in the world stop making fun of the church and start saying, wow, those people are really different and not in a bad way. They're really different in a good way. And I want to find out more about that. Why are they loving people that are being mean to them? Because that's how Jesus loved us. Jesus gave his life for us. Are you willing to give up anything for other people? First John 4, 7 and 8. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another. For love comes from God. Anyone who loves 
is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. If we know God, we will love others and we'll be God's children. 1 John 4, 12, no one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is brought to full expression in us. So let's talk about what love really is. I know I'm running out of time. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 13. I'm going to take it apart little by little. Paul says, if I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. So he's saying, I can do all of these great things, but without the main thing, I'm nothing. In Christianity, the main thing is love. The main thing is not judging others. The main thing is not putting people down because they're not as, as righteous as you. All that kind of stuff. That's not it. Paul goes on to define real love and godly character. He says love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous of someone or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own right. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of being wrong. It keeps no record of being wronged. It keeps no record of being wronged. What are we talking about? Love. Love doesn't keep record of wrongs. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. He ends up the chapter saying these three, three things will last forever in the 13th verse. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Maybe today we need to search ourselves and ask ourselves, am, am I loving others the way God wants me to? Or am I picking and choosing those that I might love and show love to? If that's the case, I need to let God do a, a different work in me. And we need to let him do it so that the world will know that God has sent Jesus. So let's decide today to love even those that are unlovely. Let's look at people through God's eyes and become merciful. Let's be like Jesus and have God's kind of love that will last forever. Does that make sense? Yes. Let's pray and then we'll have communion. Lord, I thank you that you came and showed your great love for us. That while we were still your enemies, you died for us anyway. I pray that you would teach us to look at others with compassion. 
to see the hurt that's inside of them and pray for them that God would take that hurt away so that they would stop hurting others. Help us to have your perspective on everybody that we meet. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it is Communion Sunday, first Sunday of the month. And on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he took matzah, which is close to a saltine, but it's not the same thing. He took bread and he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, take this and eat it. As often as you eat it, eat it in remembrance of me. On the same night, Jesus took the cup. It was a lot bigger piece of, uh, of a lot bigger cup than this. He lifted up the cup. It was the third cup, the cup of redemption. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. And Paul tells us that we shouldn't take the bread and the cup in an unworthy manner. And what he means by that is that we should do what Jesus said. We should take some time to remember what Jesus has done for us. That we're not just taking it, oh boy, we eat crackers and grape juice on Sunday. <coughs> That's why we give such little cups, because it's not that much to be going, oh boy, about. We should remember what he did for us. Do you remember what Jesus did for you? Yeah. And he wants us to behave similarly towards everybody else. So tonight, today, tomorrow, <laughs> wherever it is, this morning, let's take the communion elements and hold them in our hands. Ed's going to be playing worship music on the guitar. And let's just sit in God's presence, wherever you are. You might be in your car, you might be in your bedroom, you might be in your living room. Wherever you are, take those elements, hold them in your hands, and look at them and remember what Jesus did for you. So that you can go out and love everybody else. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for sending your son into the world to die for us on the cross. Because Lord, we weren't worthy of that sacrifice and we still aren't worthy of that sacrifice today, but we thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, we thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. Help us to remember you in a way that will honor you this morning. Because you indeed loved us when we were unlovable. You loved us before we ever thought about loving you. And we thank you for your sacrifice. And we thank you that you're coming again to take us to be where you are. We thank you for all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Anybody that's a believer is welcome to share communion with us this morning. God bless you as you take communion together separately.
Thank you.